integrals, the other half of calculus. If you're basically familiar with calculus and just looking for some information, this video can basically stand on its own. But if you're just learning calculus from these videos, definitely make sure to look at the previous two videos in this playlist on calculus, the calculus overview and derivatives, because they set the scene nicely. We're going to do things just the same as before. We're talking about a plot that's valid from A to B, and we're looking at a narrow region P to Q, and we have the plot there. The derivative was the slope of the function value at a particular spot, how fast it was changing. But if we go the opposite direction, instead of thinking of how fast is it changing, we think of this is how fast it's changing. So if we add it all up, what happens? So you might have velocity and take the derivative to get acceleration. How fast is the velocity changing? But if you have velocity, then you might want to get position. You might want to say, okay, I start here, and here's my velocity changing over time. Where do I end up? That's the integral. And it's the area under the curve, because basically we're just adding up the values. Adding up the values. Now, if you have values in a list, then you just, you know, add up the values, and there you go. But this is a continuous function. So what we have to do is think of it as a rectangle and take the area. Because there's no concept of just this value plus this value plus this value, because they're infinitely thin, and you'll just go on forever. But if you really think about it, if you add up an infinite set of vertical lines, which are the height of the function, you just keep adding and adding and adding, that is essentially the area under the curve. That's where this geometric definition comes from, is the geometric area under the curve is adding up all the values. And that's what we're doing. We're adding all the values. We are accumulating this function value. Derivatives are pretty intuitive, but integrals, I don't think they are. What I just said doesn't necessarily make sense to everyone. It doesn't just click in your head. So let's think about the derivative, because derivatives and integrals are opposites. So let's get the integral from the derivative. If you have the derivative at a point p, this is what I went over in the derivatives video, it is just the change in the function f of q minus f of p over q minus p. How much does the function value change based on the input value changing? And then if you do algebra on this, you end up with the starting value at p plus the derivative at p times q minus p equals f of q, the ending value. You multiply q minus p over, you add f of p over, the minus f of p becomes positive, and you just get that. The starting value plus the derivative times the time change, the amount of input change, if it's time, or whatever it is, it may not be time, equals the next value. This is just applying the derivative. This makes intuitive sense. If you have walked six miles, and you are going at two miles per hour, and the amount of time that you're going to be going two miles per hour is two hours, two hours times two miles per hour is four miles plus six miles, equals 10 miles. This is applying the derivative. You know the rate, you know the duration the rate is applying. You know the starting value, and so you know the ending value. But if we take away the starting and ending values, then we get just the accumulation. Wherever we start, if we go this fast for this long, we go, in this case, four miles. The integral from p to q of this function is four miles. We have our plot. The x-axis is hours. The y-axis, the f of x-axis, is miles per hour. And this is where you think of integration of integrals as multiplication. If you thought of derivatives as division, integrals as multiplication. Miles per hour times hours equals miles. You're multiplying the x-axis into the f of x-axis. So we've got a value on the y-axis, the f of x-axis, and a value on the x-axis. x times y, that's the size of a rectangle. That's the area of a rectangle. See? That's the geometric area. And now, hopefully, it makes more sense why we keep talking about the value under the function. Why I keep saying accumulate the function value. This is what it means. You apply the derivative to get a change. It doesn't matter if you've gone 2 miles, 4 miles, 6 miles, 10 miles, 0 miles. You could have walked backwards 9 miles. In this additional time frame, you've gone four miles. So wherever you started, it's that plus four. That's what the integral is. And to be clear on terminology, you see lots of ways to write the derivative in integral. But in this case, when you see a function, if you have f of x, then 
f prime of x is usually a derivative. Capital F of x is usually an integral. This is just common notation, just so you see it. It's, it's pretty much the shortest way to write it, so it's pretty common. But the more formal way to write it is, and I'll use the capital F, of p equals the integral from a to p of f of x dx. Or if you prefer, some people would write it f of x equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt. So first of all, the reason you have different variables here is just so it's not confusing. We're talking about this value here. This is the integral. So we're talking about the range that we're taking the integral of. The actual function is in here. So we just use different variables so we don't get confused. If we put x here, it looks like it's the same x. So we just use a different value. I like to use this one, but it doesn't matter. The other thing is this dx. Just like the derivatives, where you have df of dx, change in function value over change in inputs, and that leads to this notation, which is infinitesimals, but don't worry about that. It's the same thing here. The value of the function at a spot is the height of the rectangle when you have your plot. You have the height of the rectangle is the value of the function. The width of the rectangle is how much you're changing on the x-axis. That's the area of the rectangle, so that's where that notation comes from. And this is the other most common notation. This is called a definite integral. It's definite because you know the range. If you have what's called an indefinite integral, which we'll get into in the future, it's not it doesn't have these, it's just math. It's not a number, it's general math. But an indefinite integral on its own, if you know what that is, if you don't, then ignore what I'm saying. But an indefinite integral is not the final form. That's why it's called indefinite. Definite integral is the real integral. Indefinite is an intermediate form that you can use later to do this. And if you did not understand that, cool. This is the definite integral. What is it? The, the plot. We have a, b, and here's p. Here's the function. The integral from a to p. Well, here's a. Here's p. So it's this area. Recall that a is where the function starts. It could exist before, but we don't care. We say it starts at a. There, you can't, there's, there's nothing here. We're ignoring that. So before a, there is no function. Whether or not mathematically there could be, in our current world, it does not exist. So at a, if you do f of a, you get zero because there's nothing to have added yet. You always start on the left. It's from a forward. You always start at the beginning and you add, 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 add until you get to whatever spot, which could be up to b, and that's your integral. So f of a has to be zero. And this should make sense because you're integrating from a to a. Well, that seems like it should be zero, shouldn't it? But that's not so useful. If we have a plot a, b, p to q, we're usually considering a particular range. We shouldn't be locked to just a, now should we? We want this. We want the integral from p to q. Well, what is that? If you have this area, a to p, and you have this area, a to q, well, this area minus this area is this area, isn't it? Integral from a to q minus integral from a to p is integral from q to p. That's all it is. If we define the integral as always starting from a, we just take the bigger area minus the area we don't care about, we get the area we do care about. So let's do a little math on that function I just wrote. Let me write it again. f of p equals the integral from a to p of f of x dx. But we want the integral from p to q. Well, the integral from p to q equals the integral from a to q minus the integral from a to p. The full area all the way to q minus the area to p that we don't care about is the area we do care about. What is this? Well, this is f of q minus this is f of p. If this is our function, we have a to p. There's a to p, so it's f of p. If we have a to q, so it's f of q, there it is, a to q, and we get p to q. That's what we want. So that's the integral. If you have these two, if you can calculate these two and you subtract them, that's the integral. That's your four miles in the previous example. So now let's do something funny. I told you these are reversible. If f of p is the integral, then little f of x is the derivative. A function goes up to integral, up to next integral, down to derivative, down to next derivative. If you take the integral, then you take the derivative, you're back to where you started. Integrating and deriving integrals and differentials, derivatives, are exactly reversible operations, with the exception that when you take an integral, usually you need to know your starting point to get a value. But if you're only caring about that area, you don't care how many miles you've gone so far, you just want to know how many more miles you will be going at this rate. If that's all you care about, then just that p to q, if all you care about is p to q, then 
Integrate, derive, integrate, derive, it's exactly the same backwards and forwards. So that means this is the integral of a function, which means this is the derivative. We already had that, didn't we? So let's do f of p. f of p equals the integral at q minus the integral at p over q minus p. What did I just do? It's that derivative thing I just wrote up earlier, where I wrote f prime of p equals f of q minus f of p over q minus p. That's just the derivative. We're taking the derivative of the integral. Well, we already established the integral from p to q equals f of q minus f of p, the integral. We just did that a minute ago. But it's also just these function values. So the integral from a to q and the integral from a to p, and then the area under it, it's a derivative. What do we get from that? Same thing as before. We multiply over q minus p, we add over the negative f of p, and we get f of p plus f of p times q minus p equals f of q. It's the same thing I just did with derivatives. The value of the integral, and then you add the new area, the area of the rectangle. So the starting spot, how far you've gone so far. The integral at a f of a is zero, so you've gone nowhere. f of whatever, f of p, is how you've gone so far, how far you've gone up to this point, and then how much more you've gone, the area under the plot, the area of the rectangle, the applied derivative, add that and you get the next accumulation of the function, how far you've gone from a, the start, to q. It's like magic, it's all interwoven in back and forth between itself. Integrals and derivatives are just the opposite of each other. Furthermore, look at it one more way, let's put the f of p back over, we get f of q minus f of p equals derivative p times q minus p. This is the four miles in that example. This is the derivative applied, and this is what we decided is the integral from p to q. It's just You just do the math all you want back and forth, and you can just see how it works. So it may not be intuitive to directly think, oh, it's the accumulated area under the curve. That makes no sense, not to the human brain. But if you do the math, you can see the steps leading up to it, and you go, oh, okay. But now you say, this is extremely approximate. You've got this, this curve and you're taking a rectangle. That's real messy. How do you make it more accurate? For the derivative, when we wanted the derivative here, we would take you know a slope and then a slope and then a slope. And basically, we would just get closer and closer. We would think about this area and then this area and this area and this area and this area. And we would just zoom in as far as we want. And we can get as accurate as we want. But how do you do that to an integral? The rectangles. If you have this rectangle and you want to know its area, then you can subdivide it into other rectangles, add their areas, and you get the total area of the rectangle. So if, in fact, your rectangles are of different sizes, then you get a better approximation than the outer rectangle by doing more rectangles. Or if we look at it with a plot, we look here, and we want to take the integral here, it might be this rectangle, but if we do it over here and we do it with more rectangles, then we might have this, and then this, and this, and you can see that we're getting more accurate. Most of this, not all of it, but most of this wasted area that's wrong is not being added anymore. And if we do smaller and smaller rectangles, we get more and more accurate every single time. Whether we use the right or left, we could use this function value instead over here. See, if we have this plot and we use the left of the rectangle as the value, but then we subdivide, we could get that. And then we subdivide again, then we could get, you know, that. And we, in this case, are losing some overshoot. And then we do it over here. Let's say we use the right side. So the right side would be this tiny one here, but then we have the half tiny and then it's taller. Do that, whichever way we do it. We're either getting rid of overshoot or adding undershoot in if we use smaller and smaller rectangles. So the integral from P to Q of F of X DX is a sum. Let's say we have n. This is how many rectangles. n can be 1, n can be greater than 1. It's an integer. It's just how many rectangles. i, that's which rectangle? You know, rectangle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or rectangle 0. We can start at 0, or we can start at 1. So that would be 1 to n, or 0 to n minus 1. This is just which side of the rectangle you're going to use, which, which function value you're going to take as the height of the rectangle. Both will give you the same result, because if it's not accurate enough, you just add rectangles. You take a smaller and smaller rectangle size, more rectangles, better approximation, regardless of which one you're using. I am a programmer. 
and I like left sides of things. So I'm going to use 0 to n minus 1. It literally does not matter which you do. If you do 1 to n, then you don't have to write n minus 1. That's the only thing. But anyway, let's think about this. How wide do we have rectangles now? It was q to p. q minus p was the width of our rectangle. And then we multiply by f of p or f of q. But now it's over n. They're, they're even width. We don't need different widths of rectangles. We're just evenly subdividing. So we have the q to p range, but it's divided into that many pieces. So this is the new width of our rectangle. And the height, since I'm going to use the left side, the height is going to be f of p, but of the rectangle. So we need something fancier. f of p plus how many rectangles we've done. The width, q minus p over n, times i. So if i is 0, we have i goes from 0 to n minus 1. So we have n rectangles. So if i is 0, this is 0 and we're at p. If i is n minus 1, then we have gone all the way over to the end. So if we have, you know, three rectangles, i is 0, 1, 2. So when i is 0, you've gone 0 distance over. When i is 1, you've got one rectangle you've gone over. When i is 2, you've gone two rectangles over. So you take the function value here and here and here on the left sides. If you had i going from 1 to n, this i would cause you to always add a minimum of one rectangle. It'd be this times 1 times 2 times 3. So this times 1 times 2 times 3. So you'd be taking the function values on the right sides there, there, and there. It's the same thing. You'll get different numbers, but you don't care if you get different numbers. You just have to care about getting down to the accuracy you want. So whether, whichever one you use, just keep increasing your rectangle count. And you'll get the same result. So now we do a fancy math notation called a sum. The capital Greek letter sigma looks a lot like an E, even though it's technically an S. But anyway, there's a million different ways to write this, so I'll just write it this way. I equals 0 to n minus 1. So I is 0, I is 1, I is 2, I is dot 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 to n minus 1. For each of those values, we add together. We're starting from the left side of the rectangle. So f of p plus q minus p over n times i. That's the height of the rectangle. That's the function value on the left side. Then our dx is the width of the rectangle, q minus p over n. It's a lot to write, but it's very simple. In fact, you can just pre-calculate a lot of this. You do q minus p over n, that's your width. Width equals q minus p over n. So you can even simplify this if you want to make it look a little nicer. It's just width if you want. And this is the form you'll see when somebody is trying to use something called limits to figure out the indefinite integral. We'll do that in the future. But for the definite integral, you just pick what n is, and you just plug this into your calculator, your, your fancy integrating calculator, or you can write a program to do it, but you just decide what accuracy you want for your final result, and you just keep increasing n, increase, 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 you know, pick a, pick a million if you want, whatever, until enough decimal points stop changing each time you do it, that your error is as low as you need, and you can make your bridge. That's it. This is just adding the rectangles, and that's the integral. The definite integral, the true integral, boiled down to a sum. This concludes the introduction to calculus. Now, you understand calculus. I'm not kidding. You understand what a derivative is and how to calculate one. You understand what an integral is and how to calculate one. The fancy stuff is just doing it more formally, doing it in a, in a you know, perfectly accurate form that doesn't involve successive approximation. It's just better, nicer. But this is calculus. Right here is pretty much all you had back in the day when they invented the thing. They used different techniques, you know, or I'm, I'm basically doing a lot of intuitiveness here, where if I say the area of a rectangle and you add them up in successive approximation, that's from a modern standpoint. We get that. I can say that. You get it. Like, it's just adding numbers. It's adding areas. Back in the day, th they were coming up with this. They didn't just have it fully formed in their head, so they had to do shenanigans to come up with it, and they didn't have all of these formalisms to describe it. They came up with these. They, in this, this, they invented that. I'm just using it. So it's easier now. It's much easier to learn than to invent. But that's it. From here on, I consider it advanced calculus. This was basic calculus, and we're done. Calculus 101 is done. Advanced calculus is learning to use limits, learning history lessons of how they made calculus and why, doing indefinite integrals, th learning things like the chain rule and product rule and all that. There'll be more videos, because I love math. Math is really fun. If you like math too, go look up the number file channel on YouTube. And in the meantime, I'll be seeing you.